Thanks for downloading this episode of the BIMTube podcast. Just a reminder that you can access all the podcasts in video and audio if you visit bim.tube. So our website again is at bim.tube. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to this edition of the BIMTube podcast. So today I've got Miranda Sharp. So thank you for joining me, Miranda. You know, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, so with all my guests, I, if you don't mind, if you'd introduce yourself, but particularly also your background. But what I'm most interested with with this podcast for the benefit of people watching or listening to this for the first time, BIM in this context, just to confuse everybody, means better information management. So I'm interested in not necessarily the technical details, but um, how we can apply and have some examples. And with Miranda, I'll discuss some examples of the benefit of managing information data better today. But um, so back to Miranda, if you could introduce yourself and critically, how did you get to where you are now? What has been your journey to date? So over to you, Miranda. Oh, thank you. That's a lovely question to start with, isn't it? So um, I um, I have a chemistry degree. Um, uh, and so um, I spent I, I spent a year um, I, I, as part of my degree in a lab uh, and um, and really grotty notebooks. I used to spill chemical solutions all over, as well as all the chemical stuff, you know, as well as practical did before that. Um, so um, I've been messing about with um, with spreadsheets for a very long time. Um, uh, never, and so don't. I always feel I have to qualify. You know, don't, didn't do a computer science degree or anything. You know, richly relevant. Um, and um, um, after a few years, I started working at Royal Mail. Um, and after a period of maternity leave, um, uh, I where I hadn't, I didn't really have an actual home. So I'd done a bit of operations. I'd done a bit of shift management. Um, I'd done some sales. Done some planning. Uh, and I just come back from maternity leave, and they said, "Oh, we need somebody to run our data business." And um, you're quite good at spreadsheets. Um, and you know, that, and that, and there, I launched my career into the data industry. So I spent um, a little while running the postcode address file uh, during a time when it was richly contested intellectual property asset. Um, uh, a big open data campaign to give it away for free because it's so vital as our data infrastructure. It's uh, it's interlocutor, uh, which means that um, people like Google um, uh, can uh, you know, I can't license addressing data in the same way in the UK um, as they can everywhere else in the world. Um, and it's and it's so good for for understanding patterns. I mean, you know, I don't need to tell this audience about the benefits of geospatial data. Anyway, so I did that for a bit, um, and then I went to work at Ordnance Survey, um, which is was both a customer and supplier uh, when I was at Royal Mail, um, and doing the same thing, um, and then having the same arguments about open data and how it wasn't. Uh, that it wasn't it wasn't about giving the data away for free which by the way if you were OS um, uh, all the evidence was that as soon as you gave it away for free the people who stopped paying you money were the big Californian um, companies and now uh, that can be fine if that was your intended outcome I don't really think that was the outcome of the campaigners of the politicians at the time um, but you know, I said it's not about that it's about the business model how do you sustain a business model where the exchange of data and high quality data and data infrastructure which which you know, ordnance survey produce in vast quantities how do you get a fair exchange of value um, that incentivizes people to produce the best stuff and the most efficient outcome for the economy um, and um, so I was I was doing that and that got me involved um, in the national digital twin program ICEs uh, the ICEs project 13 um, and and sort of that that was my big introduction to the built environment sort of information management world uh, because uh, because most of our customers were um, were big infrastructure clients um, and so we was so we were, were bringing OS to smart cities and, and doing that kind of thing and then I have progressed um, through that world I'm, I'm past that world progressed through it something um, and um, I now work for myself my company is called Metis Digital. And I have enormous fun working with different types of people, um, doing interesting jobs um, uh, and and tasks, and, and meeting interesting people, and sitting on interesting panels, which is the last time we spoke, um, talking about the value of data, the importance of interoperability, um, and and ecosystems which support interoperability and exchange of information, so that we can get the best outcomes uh, for people, for society, for the planet, for the economy. You know, whatever your best outcomes are, they're probably better with data. Uh, but you probably need more than data 
um, to get the best outcomes because if you've got a whole set of decision making processes processes um, on which which are not used to using data suddenly giving them data isn't going to make them make better decisions um, so yeah it's it's, it's the carbon-based life forms are often the problem in these settings mm, yes no no comment yeah the, the people change side of it all the people so i i um so thank you for that for a very comprehensive overview of, of your background i think and a few times there you mentioned obviously open data which we'll elaborate on but and but also value of data so i mean cutting to the chase if you don't mind about the value of data which i'm particularly interested in myself personally and professionally it's do, do you Pers do you personally believe there is intrinsic value in data itself or when it's applied and I, I know you talked about decision making what what's your opinion on that how and how do we convince people of of that argument if you believe so that's a good question isn't it um is there value in data itself no After, let's go controversial with our answer sure it's how you use it um, so I can have the best data in the world, but I've never applied it to make a decision. You know, what was the point of me incurring the cost of collecting, storing it? Um, uh, so I think that's relatively easy to answer, but then of course it answers the question. Um, I think the, all the evidence is, um, and, and data, uh, and, and data is not a normal sort of good. So the analogies like oil, soil, plutonium, gold, um, air, and other, everybody's got a data is like, haven't they? Um, you know, it, it's a non-exhaustible resource, so it can be used many times um, by different people for different purposes. Um, uh, that has rather golden view of data quality. Anyway, so it's not an actual um, uh, asset, um, and it has so it has different qualities which make its value more complicated um but so all the other, but the simple answer to your question is um that data which is combined with other data and used has value so the with, without getting into the data information in but i will i guess that's information <laughs> there <laughs> and then i and then i will talk mm -hmm. about it i guess therefore the the proposition is that information has value and that based on what you just said data doesn't or or again i don't want to I, I will put words in my mouth are, mm. are we saying that it's the decisions that have the value that happen to be data based is i think so yeah, yeah i think so because you know you can have all the um uh, so the example I like to use is the Tadcaster Bridge um, flooding, uh, where um, the, the, a particular bridge um, in South Yorkshire was washed away in a big flood event. Everybody knew that their pipe was on the bridge. That's not uncommon for pipes to cross a river at a bridge. Um, but nobody knew that everybody's pipe was on the bridge. So all the information existed, but nobody took the decision to manage that asset for the risk that its failure was going to present. Yeah, so it's that cumulative, that compound view that, that where the big decision is. I, I guess if I can just keeping on the on the value theme, how do we me measure value? So again, as we discussed just before we started recording, one of the things I happen to be looking at the moment is how do we actually convince people that there is value in data or the use of information and decision making? How, how do we go about it and where do we start? And maybe if you want to pull in the ODI at this early stage, that'd be fine as yeah. well. Um, so um, how do we measure the value of, of the data? It's in the quality of the um, of the information of the uh, decision we're going to take. So and and often that is hard. So let's go back to the Tadcaster Bridge. If we'd managed that information appropriately so that we knew um, that the loss of that physical asset was also going to loss result in the loss of um, power, um, critical communications, uh, water, you know, other things as well, we would have invested differently. Now, there are people who would have um, seen that as a cost um, and the benefit was going to be hard to catch. And therein often lies the problem when having the discussion about the value of data and the value of combining data 
is that people are fairly clear the costs are always you know in in high definition and um uh, and the the benefits are somewhat fuzzy radio away some some distance away across an ocean um uh, and so the the challenge there is how do you incentivize people who are going to incur real costs in the curation the um the the making things interoperable um and in and the munging together of data how do you make the people who are going to incur those costs how do you incentivize them so that the people who are going to extract benefit from it um um, how how can you tax them? How can you put a levy on them so that um, they 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 repay uh, the people who have made the investments? Now I'm, I'm using quite woolly words there deliberately because you know what what is value to you and what's value to me are quite different things. And and certainly the work I'm doing at the moment with the Open Data Institute um, it brings that out. You know, it, it, so resilience has a has a cost and a benefit. Um, uh, early medical intervention has a cost and a benefit, um, but they're measured in quite different ways. Um, and so we, 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 the, the thing is, we need to engineer what is a fair exchange of value um, between participants. Um, and what certainly, if you talk, listen to people like um, Marcus de Sotoy or Mark Girolami talk um, about AI, you know, there, there's more data. We know, you and I know, there's, there's lots more data. You know, sensors, the sensor is connected up to everything. You know, the phone has more and more sensors in it. So there's, there's lots more data around. Um, and it isn't long before people are able, people or machines increasingly are, are able to put it together and put it together with increasing speed and with increasing accuracy. Um, and um, but it, it, but it, unless it's directed by a human, um, it, it is of marginal value. Yeah, I, I I completely agree with that that point about where's where's the there is no value in just having the the data. I think that's where there is a people go too far with, with that and then don't start talking about the decisions to obviously not yourself but one people i work <laughs> with where where it's all about the decision making isn't it or what i like to play with is i'll say to clients if you had which obviously we don't but if hypothetically they had infinite budget for data acquisition mm. you still you still need that plan about what you're going to do with it i mean that that's another sort of flippant way of fli flipping it around to say let's imagine we have every possible data set mm -hmm. you can have and still they don't people aren't thinking at that higher level but um have you got just you mentioned or even worse examples yeah. you know, I, I, I was working with a client who who was doing some work to discover how often and how much they spent on buying back their own data so this is science science-based company do do trials um and then and then because they haven't set up the the trading arrangement appropriately have to buy the data back off the people that did the did the research. You, you know you you said the word trade there and it remembered reminded me of a word I thought I was smart putting in a presentation some years ago. Just saying our data is like a commodity, right? Mm. And, and then but then I haven't done anything about it. You're at the sharp end of actually <laughs> uh, you know implementing these and getting people to think about it. But I remember thinking that that was people can kind of get a handle on it. There isn't in there maybe is a value attached to the data and it's like a commodity i don't know if what, what analogy would you give i know i know you said there's all you know data is the new oil and that is is there one that you do use or do you try and avoid them kind of analogies so it's quite nice to play with it isn't it and say look you you can you can understand for some people how it is the raw material of business so oil is a fairly good example um uh or that it's um or it's soil because it 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 enables you um, to understand what's going on in the world and, and to grow businesses with it. But like all of these analogies, they all break down. And, and it's, it's finding at the point at which they break down that's, that's interesting. So data is data, right? Um, so, um, and, it, and it has unique characteristics. And, and actually you need, so you, I think you need to go through the journey to say, it's not like this um, because it, it is inexhaustible. Um, in theory, but you know, it's but it's not inexhaustible because we need to spend money in in creating, curating, and storing it. Um, so, um, I think we we need to get we need to e explain how it's unique. Um, often by by discarding previous illusions yeah. would be my um, uh, would be the thing, and then um, and then just saying and and but value is going to mean different things to different people. 
Um, and so there are, and, and this is the, the sort of the open data debate that, that I was having years ago, is you know, there's a real difference between free speech and free beer. Um, and so transparency is inarguable. So um, uh, publicising MPs' expenses and, 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 and particularly in corrupt regimes is really important for the functioning of democracy. So, and, and, and you know, we could spend time debating whether that's worth doing, but I, I don't think that'd be productive time. Um, but then, um, but so that's at the free speech end. But then, um, free beer. I, I worry that if we go down too much down the thread uh, of saying all data should be published and made available for free, you miss a really important part of the feedback mechanism. Um, so if all I do is publish data and forget, publish data and forget about it, um, I've got I, I don't get any feedback from you. And if you then build a business. Um, and on, on the data that I'm publishing and, and giving away uh, on, on, uh, for free, you've got no comeback for me if I change the specification or forget to forget to change forget to upload the data one one day. Um, I think we've got to understand that it that it's it it, it is a thing, um, and we need to respect it um, as an asset is, is a laden term, but we need to respect it as a thing. Um, so that is important for running our business, and um, you know, it seems extraordinary that 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 we that we the businesses don't, for example. But um, because we quite often get tied up in talking about the technology and the, and um, the, the 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 bits we can touch um, that uh, support the production and use of data, rather than thinking about the, the data as a, as an asset or as a, or as a, as a component of a business in itself. Yeah, th thanks, Randa. While you were just talking, I was thinking about the making a story for that, which obviously is your profession. You you you've made a business out of being able to articulate the value. And but do, do you do you think there is a skills gap, or do, have you seen a skills gap in the ability to communicate generally? So, for example, often it's if it is technologists or data people only. I'm not saying they can't be good communicators, but would you have any observation on? perhaps there isn't the right blend of skills sometimes again i'm maybe that's a loaded question but have you got any <laughs> observation about missing skills in some areas it's funny that you and i are having this conversation um so um the gap that i see and exploit and i suspect it's not dissimilar to you interesting to get your view on this is the technologists get really excited about the technology and and that's all they want to talk about because for them it's really exciting and then Let's call them people in chinos with arts degrees, for example. Um, like, uh, uh, that's, it, it looks really hard, and those clever people have got it, and therefore I don't need to worry. Um, and um, certainly, I went to an, uh, um, a presentation on Inspire, um, which many of your listeners will be familiar with, that said the, that that it hits a sweet spot of being kind of understandable by people who don't put tables and documents, um, um, but not completely implementable by real black t-shirt wearing communities um, and so they had to collaborate to bring it in and implement it and that was good um, uh, the risk is that if the technical people think they've got it and then they, they don't in, engage the um, the salespeople or the business people um, then then they, they there's not that there's not that brick coming together of the information and the need and the decision that needs to be made um, to make sure that they support each other, um, and certainly that's the gap that I inhabit. Um, uh, you know, I said at the beginning I can't code, um, but um, I I really enjoy them and interested in the, the limits and the capabilities of the technology and what it produces because of what it can produce and what it might change in a business setting, and I think that. And and I, I, the risk is that we all become generalists, and nobody's really good at their thing. Um, but I, I think it's always worth knowing where the edges of your capability are, um, because then then you work up to that edge and say that I, I'm now here. You know, I can't do anymore. I need somebody to come the other way. Uh, the risk is that we think we can we can do it all, or that you know when when we've done, somebody will take it. Well, somebody will catch the thing we've thrown over the fence and be able to run with it. And in my experience, there's, there's less catching of stuff flung over the fence than one might hope. Mm, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Excuse me. I, I, I'm just thinking of one of the technical areas that is, well, it's always been there, but particularly talked about more than ever, which is a good thing, is interoperability. So again, I wouldn't, 
you know, I, I'll often work with people that don't even know what it is, but maybe just overview of what <laughs> what you mean by that. And, and I'm not being silly. There'll be some people who don't quite know what we mean. And then what? How how have you been involved in what? Have, what have you been working on? Uh, yeah, right. so that's so I, I the, my favourite example of this. I was working with a railway company and with a roads company, and we were trying to work out how we might be able to share data on flooding. So you know, something that we should share data on because if there's flooding coming, then you know then we can then we can take all the right action um, in order to prevent loss of life and you know, failure of the assets and stuff. Um, uh, and so we agreed this is a brilliant use case. Uh, we agreed that we should start sharing information. Um, and um, the problem is that the road people care deeply about surface water because that causes you to crash. And the railway people care about embankments getting soaked because that causes landslips um, and failure of the railway because uh, r rails float on a bed of gravel. Um, so they don't care about the same type of flooding and they measure completely different things with respect to flooding so making that data interoperable I mean, making that data join up and interoperable so one one party can use the other per person's data just look like an enormous mountain to climb um we so we just started looking for another use case because that's just you know that's just impossible right you know we can't so so um you know a more traditional problem uh, for those two uh, types of company would be uh, bridges and tunnels so if i call it a bridge do you always call it a tunnel um Oh well, sometimes I call it a bridge and you call it a tunnel. Okay, fine. But then, uh, well, when does the bridge become a tunnel, and and when does the embankment become a, a cutting? Um, uh, and so, um, you know, at, at the top level, there's some really simple translation you can do between you and me, and that makes our data interoperable. But then it gets a bit fuzzier because you know, in Scotland, well, we never really use that word, and you know, out in Norfolk, we have a completely different word. And so, um, um, there is always effort in um, translating between systems, between organizations, between industries, um, and um, that you can take two approaches to that. Um, uh, uh, you can take many more than two approaches, but at its limits, there are two approaches. There's one which is, I have a standard, and you must all conform to my standard, um, and that's the optimist view of uh, conformance. Um, and the other is, it's interesting that you have the same word for the, or different words for the same thing, what are those different words um, and how do they translate to each other? So the bridge and tunnel example or the cutting and the culvert or the, or the ditch and the gully. Um, now there are reasons why I called it a ditch and you called it a gully. Um, but for this purpose, it doesn't matter. And for that purpose, it does. Um, uh, and so actually getting getting a bit grubby with those conversations um, so that you can make the data work for everybody so that we don't have to email competing spreadsheets to each other. We can work off a common system and reduce the information rework, the waste in an organization that comes through handling information. And we can just, you know, we can collaborate and get to a better set of outcomes and decisions. Great, thank you. I, I, th I think that interoperability leads on to, to another sort of theme we were going to make, maybe mention, which is the ecosystem around it. So again, what, what do we? I mean, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Is it is it everything you just said? Is it more than the technology, or is the implication is only the technology? What what is the supporting ecosystem? What do you mean by yeah. that? Yeah, um, uh, I don't have got such an example for that. I think so. The the ecosystem. When when I think about the ecosystem, um, uh, I, I'll go back to the to the road um, example, which is some work uh, we did with OS and CDBB a few years ago. Um, you know, you can think of the road, um, uh, and different people have different view of the road, um, uh, as we can expect. So, you know, for a highways authority, um, for an economist, it's an access to economic mass. Um, it's it's a way of transporting people from uh, point A to point B and, and all points in between. Um, but um, it is also a piece of social infrastructure because it tends um, to have um, shops and doctor surgeries and, and, and things alongside it um, where people congregate. Um, and uh, and and so by uh, affecting the function of the road, you might also affect the businesses and the services which are co-located with it. Um, uh, uh, um, and the and also, you know, as particularly with new R in the in the news at the moment, um, you know, the 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 road is a large. Um, flat straight area that can be used above and below ground to lay pipes. 
Um, and so there's an awful lot of people um, and bodies and uh, actors involved in the um, in, involved in the operation of that road, um, and they form an ecosystem. They are mutually dependent. So if I have responsibility for <clears throat> Um, parking on on that road, um, how I affect it will not only how I the decisions I make will not only affect the function of the road in terms of access to economic mass, which is the economic term, um, so uh, um, and 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 is used by people to um, evaluate productivity. So I will not only affect productivity of the city or the town or whatever. Uh, I'll also affect the performance of the businesses where I change where I've done uh, who who are affected by people who park in front of it. Um, the air quality of the people. Um, I might also mess around with the um, with the sort of the power providers whose whose pipes run underneath the road. Um, and if I'm going to share data, um, you know, I, it might be easy for me to share share data with the people I work with. So if I'm in the council, for example, then it would be those. But um, and that would be a good place to start. Um, but um, I might also think about the wider ecosystem, the other people I might share data with, and bring value to um, through the sharing of data that way. So, I, so thank you, Miranda. Miranda, I, I was just thinking the in the scenarios that you're giving, it's the infrastructure heavy. Where, where is that something that you've been working with the, with the ODI? Where can people find more sort of use cases? Because obviously we're giving scenarios, and I I am interested in the ones you're giving. But on a on a broader context, are there case studies? Where do people go? Do you know what I mean? I, as you know, I often work for the railways. It's easy for, for people like me. But where, where would people go to, to get this material? Um, so the ODI is a great, is a great place to yeah. start. Um, okay. uh, and um, <laughs> although it's all very open um, and not very sort of graded, um, as we might talk about. Um, but increasingly, we're talking about um, we're talking about data institutions, for example. So organisations that are set up to collate information for the good of a community. Um, so uh, the example there is uh, Hilo, which collates information on tides. Um, because if you're in shipping, you need to know where tides are and, and uh, where, when the most efficient place for you to go to and from um, is. So um, we've, we've just published our report on the value of the social and economic value of data. Um, there's more coming soon. Um, uh, so there's an open bibliography. Uh, so if people have got ideas they want to contribute, then we're really, really keen to hear from you. Um, we've been working with Professor Diane Coyle of the Bennett in Institute on the value of data for some time. Um, so reports just come out and we're just developing um, a canvas. Um, uh, uh, we, 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 it makes me laugh. So people tell me they want a, um, uh, uh, a decision tree. It says, help me, help, give me something that will help me make a decision on which is my most valuable data or where I should do the intervention or what kind of ecosystem I need in order to support the greatest value. And say, so, well, OK, but apparently everybody says they want a decision tree and actually what they really want is a canvas. They want a way to frame their discussion um, with their uh, peers and colleagues. Um, and so that they can have an, a structured discussion about risks and benefits and opportunities, and, and they want to sort of feel confident that they're having the right base discussion. So we 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 called it a canvas. Um, I, I suspect for some clients, we'll end up calling it a decision tree because that'll make them happier. Um, but uh, do it. people people come at this in different ways. And so the ODI is you know se sector sector neutral has done a lot of work um, in the built environment, uh, but also with health and banking. Um, uh, uh, and and others, um, I have to say others in case I've got nothing else. Um, so um, yes, go go along there to the odi.org. Great, thank you. I I just thought I'd ask there because we're on that theme. Normally I I wait till the end to ask for links, but I thought I thought that's so so important and pivotal to the theme that, that we're yeah. talking about. You mentioned there you you dropped in new R, um, yeah. so I thought. Again, there'll be people that don't know. Uh, yeah. If you just, if you wouldn't mind, just mentioning the Geospatial Commission and um, National Underground Asset Register, and yeah. how have you been involved, or uh, you know what's going on there? What what are they doing? Basically? Well, yeah, I'm wondering yeah. if you know more than me, um, actually. So, no, um, not, not, no, I no, I won't. No, no chance. Yeah, well, I, so I'm not involved, um, and so this is my personal opinion. I, I think it's really important that I preface that because okay. I've got friends who have been involved. Um, so the Geospatial Commission, um, uh, one of the things it got hold of very early on was uh, this idea of collating information about underground assets. So I talked a moment ago about um, roads and that we know there's a 
a, a scary number of people killed all over the world every year uh, because they dig into a into a, a surface and find a pipe um, that they didn't know was there, and that causes them harm. It causes delay um, to projects, um, and it, it, it does bad things. So, you know, wouldn't the world be a better place if there was a decent map of stuff that was underground? Um, so, um, wouldn't wouldn't it be a better, better, better place? Undeniably, the question is yes, um, but the answer is also a bit more complicated than that, um, because actually, at the moment, we don't know where all this stuff is, um, and that's fine because it means that bad actors, and there are some, you know, not everybody is as sweet and benign as you and me, um, now have a map to find the most vulnerable place in the network. So by knowing where, knowing everything, which bridges everything is crossing, not only do you make, can you make the network more resilient, but you can also make it more vulnerable uh, because some, because the, the, the weaknesses in the network are more visible. So it needs to it needs to have security involvement, and that is really important. Now, the the excellent people who've been working on the underground asset register um, will tell you that the the most um, valuable thing they've created is data sharing agreements, um, and um, and that those data sharing agreements are really important because um, everybody's worried about sharing their data. And we talked about this before, didn't we? You know, there's you you need to hit a sweet spot between my my data is completely priceless and utterly wonderful, and therefore I'm not sharing it with anybody. Um, or they might have to give me a million pounds just to even sneak a peek at it. Um, uh, and, and so they don't share it. Um, and then the other, the, the other, you know, the other end of the pivot is, um, um my data is pretty hopeless really. And I forget to collect it most days and it's, we change specification at that point and, and then we change units and, um, and, and so it's a bit rubbish. And actually if I, if I show it, then you will all see how weak my business is. Um, and those are both really strong incentives not to share. No, notwithstanding, if I share personal information, the CFO is going to be all over me because I'm, you know, I'm exposed to four percent of global turnover. So the the disincentives to share data are really strong, and so a data sharing agreement is a hard thing to agree. Um, and they've done super work in so doing, um, and they've created this thing, um, which means that people will be safer at work and we'll know more about um, the, the right people will know about more where assets are. The thing, as the value of data nerd in this conversation, uh, that frustrates me slightly um, is that, um, remember I talked a bit at the beginning about people are going to need to invest to curate and store and make this data useful. Who's paying for that? Um, and you know, notwithstanding, there are people who've been running a business like that for quite some time. Um, but you know, how, do you, how do you make it self-repair? So if I dig a hole and find your pipe, and your pipe is in marvelous condition. How can I report back? How am I incentivized to improve the quality of the data which exists? Say, oh, either it wasn't where you said it was, or it's in terrible nick, or it's in great nick. Um, you know, how do I incentivize the collection and and updating of those records um, to support an ever ever improving data asset? Um, because you know, data rots. It's like it's like everything. Um, it becomes obsolete. Which uh, there's an acronym of rots, which I can't remember. Um, so data rots. Um, how do you, you you need to keep investing in it, um, and it it won't be enough um, just to have created this marvelous thing. We need to find um, financially sustainable ways of keeping it updated, keeping it useful, keeping it relevant, um, so that so that we do build an economy based on really good data that will be the envy of the world. Mm, yeah, that 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 ongoing maintenance of is, I mean, as you know, you've you've just said is is that challenge, isn't it? it I'm flabbergasted some, sometimes at how whether a lot of smaller projects perhaps where people still think it's a project you know the the acquisition of data is the and it's probably technology centric and you think no no that's the <laughs> that's the beginning <laughs> but it anyway but i guess that is the challenge as you've articulated i'd be amiss if i didn't at least mention because i know we haven't got too long left um i'm just going to say it you might have already said it already but digital twins mm. Uh, of course, I have to mention these, right? So um, we we both do. We do, yeah, but I, I don't know if there's a law yet, but um, uh, <laughs> there might be. So, but digital twin, do you <laughs> see that as partly the reason I was just thinking of it? There is 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 that does that help with the last point you were making? Because a digital twin, in whatever form it takes, <laughs> is some form of manifestation of an asset. Does does that help the conversation? Or, or um, does it help at least literally illustrate the value? <laughs> what do you think? Um, so um, yeah. the um, well, you know, 
a digital twin is just data, isn't it? Really? Um, and you know, it's not the end in itself. So I've created a digital digital twin, marvelous what for. Um and um and and therefore has it costed in. You know, I'd love to see a digital twin that costed in. I'd love to see that business case. I would really love to see that. Um, um I, I fear that, that all too soon we will see them, but they will be for isolated objects. Um so I've got this marvelous digital so I, so that's the example. So you know they, they were built originally for aero engines. And of course it makes sense, you know, multi-component, really expensive, difficult, unwieldy thing. Um, I need a digital representation of that thing functioning um, so that um, so that I can decrease my maintenance bill, decrease my construction bill and increase the longevity of the asset. Marvellous. Um, but I, I also, but I need that digital twin of the road and I need the digital twin that tells me about flooding. Um, and the risk is that we've built, we build a whole load of silo digital twins that never talk to each other that are then um, you know that, that then that so we never we never tackle the big problems like climate change um, or pandemic response um, that for which you you need you can't have a siloed response. Yeah, and it's that system of systems to uh, to steal the phrase from uh, Mark Enzen, no doubt you, yourself is. But I, I I think that's absolutely right, isn't it? Is it it can be. How do we get people interested in scale? Is just is just an observation. What 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 do you th think is the challenge there? So you know, mm. people are focused on their asset or their system because it's yeah. their day job. I, I like to yeah. sort of play with that when I do training. I'll say people who are focused on a project probably should be. That's by definition their day job. <laughs> it's not actually their day job to look at the integrated system. So mm. I get just putting it out there, how, how do we get people interested in a system-wide approach if it's not their day job? Is mm. is is it making is it talking more about sustainability? Is it regulating it? How, have you got any thoughts on that? How, how do we get people to think about systems approach if it's just not what they do typically? A step at a time. I think so. Um, going from managing the tarmac to managing the whole transport infrastructure, quite a big step. Um, but getting them to share information between teams, where they work for the same organisation, uh, would be would be a very very useful way. Um, uh, get it, it. It is their day job um, to reduce the waste in their in their day job. So you know, where do you where do you currently produce the same data? As somebody else and then fight about it well that's a waste isn't it how, how can we how can we integrate that um uh where uh, the, i think about the supply chain a million years, years ago i used to work for a, a car component company and you know we, we, it was well how much are you sending how much are you sending how much are you? and if that data was just transparent and we just all we all we all talk the same language and had access to the same systems that that meant we knew how many hondas were being pushed off the end of the line then we could all produce the right amount of brake components. Um, so, um, we, we, yes, it's, it's a laudable aim. Um, and so, some people will be motivated by the idea of making the world a more sustainable place. Um, but those people who do their day jobs diligently uh, will understand the benefits of, of sharing data with, with neighboring teams more efficiently. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Incentive, I know you mentioned incentivizing already, but I find that. A, a, cha a challenge that's also part of my data how do you incentivize people in mm. new areas of uh, i know that's what we're talking about and it it is multifaceted i i wonder if we could just come back to one of the first topics where we we talked about the value and giving incentives could you just elaborate just but mainly as a, as a list perhaps as well of <laughs> what, what are the what people what are the value sets that people see so you know, with ESG in mind, and again, this might be a new theme for people where when we talk about value, uh, you've articulated that probably we don't necessarily mean monetary value, but what, what, how do you articulate value with clients? How do they, what, what do they want to hear? Is it, is it pound notes or dollar signs? Mm. Is it well, so revenue is nice, but I think revenue is the furthest away. Um, so efficiency, um, and, and that, that can be quite hard. Um, because often you're telling people that, so the efficiency you're not measuring, we're going to save it. Brilliant. I'm not going to be famous for that, am I? Um, so it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's an, a measured inefficiency. 
um, is 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 a good thing. Um, and people are getting wiser to that so because more data is being produced. Um, there is there is um, you know, I know I've got all this data and I know I'm managing it inefficiently. I haven't got a number of how inefficiently I'm managing it. Please, can you just help me make it more efficient? Um, is is a start, um, uh, and then if you're a contributor, so think about the healthcare system. We've done some work in recently. Um, I know it's unsustainable for me to push um, ever more niche and ever more expensive drugs. Um, I know I've got to be in the business of prevention, and therefore I need to have a better understanding of lifetime value. And I've never needed it before. Um, but I know I, I need to talk about patient outcomes um, and uh, I, I need to talk in a different way about the interventions I make into a system. Um, and so I think that there's a bit of becoming more aware, um, uh, uh, but there's uh, I think if we, we're, we're talking about efficiency and effectiveness for a while, um, if you promise people that by selling their data they're going to get they're going to get rich, um, I fear um that you incentivize the whole set of wrong behaviors um i go right back to the beginning in postcodes you know that nobody that that was never meant to be sold um it was just a it, it was an if it, because it was an efficient byproduct that needed to be consistently prepared um it, it became useful for other way it became useful in other ways but um if you focus too hard on the money it's going to make you, um, you know, focus first on how the better use of your data in your organisation is going to make you more efficient and therefore may may produce you more value um, and more revenue um, that way. Yeah, great. Thank you, Miranda. We um we we talk, we were just talking before we started recording just about some examples of organisations that have measured value. Are you able to? share some of them either that you've directly or indirectly directly worked with some of the infrastructure companies that we're talking about that have case studies well so highways have, have done the biggest piece of work on the value of data and that that piece of work uh, was done uh, with anmut I and mean, they've got a very enlightened team um uh, that um, have worked with anmut and done some good work um uh, there are there's another company i work with chiasm uh, i've also got to talk about that um who um uh, who look at organizations and say well where where are you inefficient where are you failing to meet demand with supply so they started um in retail um where if you're you are velux it's really important on the difference between a skylight and a roof light if you're a customer you're very unlikely to search for different different things um and therefore uh, uh, so how do you present your product in a way that is relevant to what the customer is looking for um, and that, that's how chiasm showed uh, value um, in, in data. Um, uh, uh, the risk is that we start talking about data as an asset and we start saying that my customer database is more valuable than your customer database and the truth is um, they're probably right for the right things but they're not they're, they're not the kind of um, bits of value of data that most light my fire. I'm much more about how can we share data to create more value for everyone rather than how can we try and barter off each other's data against each other. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm completely with you. I realise I've only got a few minutes left with you, so um, I'm, I'm sure I could keep asking you questions all day. But are there any, we've mentioned the ODI and obviously I'll link to that um, in the description, but are there any other web pages or resources just off the top of your head just a handful that you'd recommend people go and look at oh go, go and have a look at chiasm because they do such cool stuff okay um k-a-i-a-s-m um uh, um and um and c-sense who i used to work with um who are the bike light people um who um who create a clever bike light, which has it's become really useful since the pandemic um because now they can track micro my mobility um, so that we get the right infrastructure to support um, people on bikes and, and um, scooters, and that's really important. Because you know, the risk is with that with that kind of data. You know, originally it was procured, it, it was produced by people who were showing off on Strava, and that's probably quite an unuseful um, set, set of people to get together data for if you want to understand commuting habits. Um, so go and have a look at CSense because um, they are they're great fun as well. And you you probably know more than me. Who else do you think? me uh oh well I'd, I'd i'd recommend that people look at the what was the cdbb pages mm -hmm. to get an overview so go to the dt hub yeah dt hub is active and um 
Well, quite a few. Yeah, put them on the spot now. Maybe if people want to get into the actual information management side of it, I know we're talking about a lot broader topic than that. Then things like um, UK, what was UK BIM Alliance NEMA? That's very specific, um, but I, th I think that helps. And then also, which uh, if people just search around things like, and I don't know if you're familiar with this one, Miranda, ISO 55000, it is I a standard, it, yeah. but there is the Institute of Asset Management. I realize mm -hmm. we're talking about data, but it, it closes no, the loop, they, They've done it? some good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I yeah. wrote the standard. I wrote a flex standard, BS Flex 260, about the national standard. Yeah. Sorry, thing. I know you need to go, but could you just quickly mention that? That'd be great. So just say what the flex standard is and what the purpose of it was. That'd be great. Uh, oh, you asked me to remember. Um, so it was written. Um, it was written. So um, why, why did we write it? It was. It was about. Um, how what it was meant it was, it was an introduction to digi digital twins and it was built off the end of an of another standard on information management so there's a whole family of standards um around information management um and we wanted to make sure that digital twins had a place at that table um alongside asset management um uh, and um and information flows in, in internet of things you know when, when you're at the confluence of so many things i um, you need to sort of a lot you know it's, it's like that last piece of the jigsaw it has to it has to fit um with all those with all those other parties that was the challenge great thanks so, so i will link to that as well it's um escaped my mind that was something i did want to ask you about but at least we've mentioned so, so it's bsi flex 260 so i will i will link to that great thank you I know you have to go. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. And um, I hope to speak to you again soon. I'll let you go. But thank you very much indeed, Miranda Sharp. Thank you very much, Steve. What a pleasure. Mm -hmm.